And while we wait, um, while we wait, I just want to make sure that you can hear me okay. And if somebody in the chat will just let me know that you see Immunity 101 slide up on the screen and that you can hear me, that would be great. And great, thank you, Rebecca. That was really quick. And there's a question and answer box or panel. And if you have any questions, please put them in there. And I will be watching that. And at the end, I'll answer as many of the questions as I can. And I am recording this. It will hopefully be posted in a day or two on our blog site, naturalcompounder.com forward slash blog. And we have a lot of our webinars there, so it's very easy for you to go back and see what else we've recorded. We also have a YouTube site that has a lot of them, but if you go to the blog site, we do have them posted there. All right, and let me just get my screen set right. <clears throat> All right, so thank you very much for joining us. And if your slides, if the slides or the sound does freeze, please refresh your browser. It's usually an internet connection issue and that should correct it. And as I said, type your questions in the Q&A box and I'll get to them at the end of the, percent, the um, presentation. And if everything works properly, there'll be a recording on naturalcompounder.com forward slash blog in a day or two. So tonight I'll be talking about how the immune system works, how digestion, stress, and the immune system are all interconnected and how you can support your immune system, especially with everything that's been going on the last year and a half, and we're gonna be heading into the cold and flu season. And this webinar and, and associated materials are for educational purposes only. The information provided is not intended to treat, cure, or prevent disease. And this, these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. So having a good immune system takes thought and planning, and you need to work on it every day. It should be part of your lifestyle. Gentle support every day is much better and more effective than waiting till you get sick and taking a whole lot of supplements just trying to get you over the cold or the flu. And here's some important ways to support your immune system. Eating a healthy diet, balancing stress, quality of your sleep, your personal hygiene, um, and having a healthy diet. And we'll be talking about a lot of these points tonight. The immune system is the body's defense system. It's an interactive network of organs, white blood cells, pro and proteins that protect the body from viruses, bacteria, fungi, and any foreign substance. We're continually exposed to organisms that are inhaled, swallowed, or inhabit our skin and mucous membranes. Whether or not these organisms lead to disease is decided by the integrity of our body's defense mechanism. Washing our hands properly and often is probably one of the best things we can be doing. Avoiding people who may be sick lessens our exposure and risk level. And with COVID and everything been, that's gone on, I think part Part of what we've learned from that is if you don't feel well, whether you're a student or someone working and you're not sure, is it just a cold or you might be coming down with the flu or hopefully not COVID, stay home and stay away from people till you know you're not infectious. And this has helped keep numbers down. The immune system works to neutralize and remove pathogens that enter our body. It recognizes and neutralizes harmful substances from the environment and fights against the body's own cells that have changed due to an illness. When our immune system is working properly, we don't even notice it. But when we have an under or overactive immune system, we're at a greater risk of developing infections and other health conditions. 
Antibodies are part of a large family of chemicals called immunoglobulins, and they play many roles in our immune system response. IgG marks microbes so other cells can recognize and deal with them. IgM focuses on bacteria. IgA congregates in fluids such as our tears and saliva, where it protects the gateways into the body. IgE protects against parasites and is also to blame for allergies. And IgD stays bound to B lymphocytes. It helps them to start our immune response. Antibodies lock onto the antigen and are an invading organism, but they don't kill it. These, these just mark the offending organism for other cells in our body to attack and destroy. Everybody's immune system is different, but as a general rule, it becomes stronger during adulthood, as by this time we've been exposed to more pathogens and develop more immunity. This is why teens and adults tend to get sick less often than children. Once an antibody has been produced, a copy remains in the body so that if the same antigen appears again, it can be dealt with more quickly. This explains why with some diseases such as chickenpox, you can only get it once as the body has a chickenpox antibody stored, ready and waiting to destroy it the next time it arrives. This is called immunity. Immunity can be broken down into innate and acquired, and then acquired into active and passive. We're born with our innate immune system. It provides a general defense against common pathogens, which is why it's also known as the nonspecific immune system. It's the rapid response system, and it's the first response when an invader is identified. The cells of the innate immune system surround and engulf the invader. The invader is killed inside the immune system cells. These cells are called phagocytes. The adaptive immune system can target specific threats against viruses and bacteria that the body has previously had contact with. With help from the innate immune system, innate immune system it produces antibodies after the body has been exposed to the invader. It can take several days for the antibodies to develop, but after the first exposure, the immune system will recognize the invader and defend against it. The adaptive immune system changes throughout a person's life. Passive immunity is borrowed from another source, but it doesn't last indefinitely. For instance, a baby receives antibodies from the mother through the placenta before birth and in breast milk following birth. This passive immunity protects the baby from some infections during the early years until the baby's own immune system is more fully developed. The gut microbiome provides essential health benefits to the host, particularly by regulating immune homeostasis. Dysbiosis is an alteration in the imbalance or an imbalance in the gut microbiome. It's associated with development of several autoimmune conditions and other health issues. The way the immune system develops is affected by the microbiome. Babies are born with essentially no microbiome. Their gut is sterile and in a very immature immune system. And let me start that again, sorry. I was thinking of my next line. Um, babies are born with a sterile gut, so they don't have a good microbiome. And they also have a very immature immune system and the two develop alongside each other informing one another as they identify more things that need to be dealt with. The first microbes to colonize in a baby's gut, skin, and mouth help teach the immune system what's harmful and what isn't. When microbes are missing, the immune system doesn't develop as it should. And this is one of the problems with babies that are born by C-section. They don't pass through the vaginal canal and get that initial load of healthy bacteria from the vaginal mucus. And if, they, if the babies aren't given the good bacteria, and there are some specific blends for newborns that were de delivered by C-section, 
they can develop asthma, allergies, more respiratory infections, bowel issues, and type one diabetes and obesity as they get older. There's a greater chance of that. And this just shows you how important a healthy microbiome is. Throughout life, the type of microbes and where they colonize has an effect on our T and B cells, which are part of the immune system. Certain bacteria sparks immune responses by promoting the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines where other bacteria favor regulatory T cells and provide help with gut homeostasis. Exposure to microbes in the gut leads to a more diverse immune response. They provide an educational process to the adaptive immune system. Without this process, there's an increased susceptibility to various immune disorders, both inside and outside the gut. This slide shows how the gut lining, and there's been a lot of talk lately about leaky gut, can get disrupted and lead to an immune response, food intolerances, and more gut inflammation. The gut can have a positive effect on the immune system, um, the healthy microbes in it, and a negative effect if there's dysbiosis, unhealthy balance of organisms. And if you look at this chart, you can really start anywhere and see if you have any of these issues, it can spin either clockwise or counterclockwise. If somebody has a leaky, has food intolerances or they drink too much alcohol or are very stressed, that can affect the gut lining, which then leads to food intolerances. The food intolerances cause the gut to get inflamed, which leads to more le leaky gut, which causes the body to start reacting to food. So you have more food sensitivity, which disrupts the whole process. And so it can really cycle clockwise, counterclockwise and start anywhere. Leaky gut syndrome describes intestinal permeability. It's basically caused by inflammation of the gut lining. This inflammation is usually brought about by antibiotics, which lead to an overgrowth of abnormal flora in the gut, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as aspirin, ibuprofen, Vicodin, and other prescription pain medicine can disrupt the gut. Alcohol and caffeine are very strong gut irritants. Gluten and other proteins from wheat can cause a problem for a lot of people. Glyphosate, which is the main ingredient in Roundup, it's in our water, it's in most of our food. Um, it was first patented as an antibiotic because it was known to interfere with one of life's processes in bacteria. So when we're eating food that has glyphosate on it or in it, it kills some and disrupts some of the normal bacteria in our gut. And that allows an overgrowth of some of the pathogenic organisms. Mold and fungal mycotoxins stored in grains, fruit, refined carbs, and also we can get those from water damage in our house. If you've had any ice dams and you start getting mold growing, that can affect our gut. Foods and beverages contaminated by parasites like Giardia, Chrysosporidium can cause problems. Food and beverages contaminated by bacteria such as hel um, Helicobacteria, and Klebsiella, we're seeing more and more of this, can promote dysbiosis. Some of the chemicals that we add to fermented food and processed foods and the dyes and preservatives, that can cause a problem. Enzyme deficiencies, some examples of that are people who are suffering from celiac or lactose deficiency. Prescription drugs such as prednisone can irritate the gut lining. And even the hormones as birth control pills can be very, very disruptive of the gut lining. Broad spectrum antibiotics are the primary cause of leaky gut. And that's not just antibiotics that we're ingesting when we're sick. It's also there's antibiotics that are fed or injected into cattle and different animals. And then we eat that protein and they're detecting levels of antibiotics even in the milk that we're drinking. So we have to be very careful to try to eat as clean as possible. So our body is made to naturally fight back against germs and protect us from harm. Supporting our immune system strengthens that response, but it usually takes a little time for that to kick in. 
the first course of action and the easiest is to fix the things that stress the immune system. Stress in general, not getting enough sleep, poor diet, not getting enough sunshine or exercise really cause immune system problems. They weaken our immune system. Stress and poor nutrition are destabilizing to the immune system. A few basic lifestyle changes can do a lot to provide support for your immune system instead of helping break it down. Get an adequate amount of sleep, preferably around the same time each night, just like we did with children. They have a bedtime and a time that they're supposed to go to sleep. Sleep and the circadian rhythm exert a strong regulatory influence on our immune system. Regular exercise can lower stress and promote good circulation, which allows the cells and substances of the immune system to flow freely throughout our body and do their job efficiently. Exercise shouldn't be too strenuous. Over-exercising weakens the immune system. But a regular routine, walking, hiking, and you know, doing some aerobic exercise in the house, some weightlifting, is very, very good to stimulate our lymphatic system. Sunshine is really the best way for the body to get vitamin D. Um, the problem is, especially up here in, in the north, we're going into the darker times of the year. So supplementation might be necessary for a lot of us. We should try to eliminate exposures to toxins, eat organic as much as possible, stop smoking or vaping. No harsh cleaners in the house. That's another source of toxicity and disruption of our microbiome. We should avoid the blue light from screens late at night and try to keep our EMF levels down. We shouldn't be sleeping with our cell phones right next to our bed. Don't have the router for your Wi-Fi in the bedroom. We should avoid, expo we should avoid exposure to people with colds or other infections. We should reduce our stress. You can do a lot of things to help minimize stress. Practicing, as I mentioned before, good hygiene. Wash your hands frequently and thoroughly with soap and water. That's the best way. That's more effective than hand sanitizers. Take care of your teeth. When there's gum infections or an infected tooth, that can affect the whole body and really strain the immune system. Only use antibiotics when you absolutely need them because they, they destroy both the good and the bad bacteria and they don't have any effect on viruses. You should be using a probiotic. If you're on an antibiotic, a couple of hours after the dose, take a probiotic to reseed the beneficial bacteria. Hydration, drinking water throughout the day and staying hydrated, that helps bring all the nutrients to all the cells and the waste product out. Be staying hydrated, very good for the immune system. And again, stop unhealthy habits, smoking, vaping, staying up at all hours and eating a poor diet. So probiotics are defined as live microorganisms. And when administered in adequate amounts, they confer a health benefit to the host. About 70% of our immune response comes from the healthy bacteria in the gut. And we don't just need one or two bacteria. You should take a probiotic that has a lot of different strains because each bacteria has a specific job in the body. A couple of examples, the bifido breve helps produce natural antibiotics such as lactobrevin. The bifido inf infantis, it stimulates the production of cytokines, which help regulate the immune system. The lactobacillus organisms help manage regulatory T cells. And it goes on and on. Um, they, they can help with vitamin um, lactobacillus brevis, helps with the synthesis, with our making of vitamin D and K in our body. And it, so having a healthy gut can help you maintain some hormone levels, some vitamin levels, a lot of the Bs, vitamin D, our immune system. So those friendly bacteria really are helpful. These are just two examples of some well-formulated and tested probiotics. They have multiple strains. The one on the left, the enterobiotic, is a refrigerated probiotic. 
very, very effective. The one on the right is an example of a non-refrigerated, it's shelf stable. And what they do is some of the bacteria are temperature stable up to you know very hot temperatures. So they can be stored on the shelf and they remove the ones that have to be refrigerated. So depending upon if you're gonna be traveling or if you can't remember to go to the refrigerator, a non-refrigerated that's well formulated and, sh and temperature stable could be very beneficial. If you can take a refrigerated one, that really is the better of the two. Another thing or nutrient that can be very helpful for the immune system is magnesium. We think of magnesium as something that helps relax a muscle after it's been contracted or helps calm us down to help us relax or sleep. But magnesium has a very strong relationship with our immune system. It's involved in more than 300 chemical reactions in our body. It's a cofactor of those. The muscles need magnesium to relax. The nerves need it to send and receive signals and messages. It keeps our heart beating steady and the immune system strong. Magnesium participates in our immune response in numerous ways. It's a cofactor for immunoglobulin synthesis. It helps with immune cell adherence. It's an antibody, it's antibody dependent killing or cytol cytolysis. It's involved in the IgM lymphocyte binding. It helps the macrophages respond to the lymphocytes and it goes on and on. And we don't really think of magnesium as being part of our integral in the immune system, but it really is important to have a good magnesium level. And if you're not dehydrated and you have tight muscles or you're having restless leg or charley horses, there's a very good chance you're low in magnesium. And a question we get asked a lot is what type of magnesium to take? There's all different salts of magnesium. Some magnesiums like magnesium citrate isn't absorbed that well. So that one's very good for the bowel to help with constipation. Magnesium glycinate is highly absorbable. Magnesium threonate is highly absorbable. And also that one is one of the best ones to cross the blood brain barrier. So that can help with calming in the brain. And there's a magnesium you add to water, it's called calm. And that you take it in the evening and it can be very calming for the muscles and for the central nervous system. So don't forget a simple thing like magnesium. We also have to worry about free radicals. Free radicals are generated just from us being alive. It's a normal cellular metab metabolism byproduct and they result from metabolism of drugs and chemicals that we ingest, and also just from our body functioning normally. Exposure to ultraviolet light, cigarette smoke, and other environmental pollutants also increases the body's free radical levels. The body has a system in place to deactivate these, they're really toxins, they can do damage in our body. And most of the things that we use are antioxidants, which are some of the nutrients that we get from our food. And our problem is we're not getting enough from our diet if we're not eating a real good diet. So we have too many free radicals and they can weaken our immune system and damage our body, the proteins in our body. We also need our antioxidants as cofactors for a lot of our metabolic pro, um, processes. So if we have too many free radicals, we're using our antioxidants to get rid of the free radicals, and that slows down a lot of the other metabolic processes. Clinical trials have found that antioxidant supplementation can significantly improve certain immune responses, specifically supplementation with vitamin C, E, and A, and or beta carotene, increase the activation of cells that are involved in helping us detect precancerous and cancerous cells. Supplementation with antioxidant vitamins also protects our immune response in individuals exposed to certain environmental sources of free radicals. A lot of the chemicals and the pollution we're exposed to on a daily basis generates a lot of free radicals in our body. So now the next thing I'd like to point out, so we're thinking more is better. That seems to be a mantra that we have a lot. 
And that isn't true. You don't need huge amounts of of certain antioxidants for just good all around protection. You need some of a lot of them. So you're better off with a formulation that gives you a lot of the antioxidants. And I put, this is the label from this product and it just shows all the way down to the bottom here, all the different antioxidants that are in there. And if you look at the milligrams, it's not high, high amounts. Sometimes people need a lot of antioxidants for specific reasons and you would take a larger amount. But in general, just having a balanced low level amount of a lot of them is much more effective than taking a whole lot of a few of them because they all work together. And if you have too much of one and not enough of another, you're not helping get rid of the free radicals. Mushrooms, if they're prepared properly and you have to be careful how they're processed and that they're very clean because they could have chemicals sprayed on them depending upon where they're grown. But reishi and chaga are very helpful for the immune system. On reishi, a study in 2019 showed some of the polysaccharides from reishi mushroom activated dendritic cells, which act as messengers to bring antigens to the immune cells and increase the number of T cells. Chaga is another one that supports the immune system and overall health. And some of the studies show that some of the constituents in chaga help stimulate functions that can increase our immune response and decrease inflammation and inflammation lowers our immune system. And again, the products I'm showing are just an example. There's a lot of good products and to choose a good product, you should talk to where you're buying them to make sure some, especially mushroom products, some of them need to be an al extracted in an alcohol um, process. Some of them need to be extracted by water. There's different parts of the mushroom that have the beneficial qualities in them. So just taking a ground up mushroom in a capsule doesn't do anything. The body can't access what's in there. It has to be released and then we can use it. Here's a list of some um, nutrients that can be very helpful for the immune system. And I'll just run down a little bit on each of them. And again, we need the right amount for our body. We don't need excessive amounts. If we take too much of a good thing, turns it into a bad thing. So enough is the right amount, but going much higher than that can be detrimental to the body. So selenomethionine, or selen that's from selenium, um, gets metabolized, and that's critical for our immune and antioxidant responses. Selenium is a cofactor in a lot of the different pathways, one of them being glutathione peroxidases, and we need glutathione to help us detoxify our body. Vitamin A is essential for cell growth, immune function, and vision. Together with vitamin D, vitamin A helps regulate the gastrointestinal microbiome, which is an important part of our immune system. We all know Linus Pauling and vitamin C, or ascorbic acid, is a well-known antioxidant. It helps recycle some of the other antioxidants, and is very good at enhancing our immune system. Vitamin D plays a very important role in modulating immune system function and a deficiency can lower one's immune system and their risk for illness and infection. And some of the studies now, especially over the last year and a half with COVID, they're finding in communities or groups of people that have very low vitamin D, they have a much higher incidence of getting... Uh, contracting COVID, but also having a serious um, case of it. Vitamin K2 is the most biologically active form of vitamin K. It's known for moving calcium into the bones and removing it from arteries, but also it's very important for immune signaling. It's extremely important for the optimal function of vitamin D, and we know how important D is for our immune system. And zinc, 
is very good for the immune system. We used to use zinc lozenges if we thought we were getting a cold and having a coating of zinc down our mucous membranes in the throat helps block the viruses from getting into our system. And studies have found that zinc can reduce the duration of a cold or flu and lower the number of respiratory infections. Research shows that supplementation may also reduce the incidence of infections and inflammation, particularly in the elderly. One caution about zinc, zinc can be very irritating for a lot of people for their GI system. Zinc gluconate or zinc bisglycinate are very well absorbed and much less irritating to the GI system. And also with zinc, it isn't absorbed very well. So getting a, a better absorbed formula, you'll get more bang for each dose. And they found by adding quercetin with the zinc, it really increases the absorption of the zinc. Now, this one is comes, some come with, you'll see there'll be zinc and quercetin and other things all together. There's a lot of multiple nutrient products now, so you don't have to have 20 bottles lined up. Now, some I'll show you in a little bit some of the recommendations for amounts of zinc, which is much higher than what we normally would take and what the biologists and um, different research is showing is that the people, when we're taking much higher doses of zinc, we should have our copper level checked because as a zinc level or ingestion goes up, the body's copper level goes down and there's a healthy ratio of zinc and copper. And copper is a very, very necessary nutrient for our body. So we don't, that's why I said a few slides ago, more is good up to a certain point. It should be more up to the point the body needs. But if you go way too much of a good thing, you can create other problems. And this is, these are some of the things that copper is necessary for in our body. If we need it to make our red blood cells and keep the nerve cells healthy, we need it for the immune system to help make collagen, to protect the cells from damage, to absorb our iron into the body. It helps turn the sugars in our body into energy. So if you're overloading on zinc to help prevent you from hopefully getting sick and support the immune system, but you pushed your copper level down, you're really defeating what you're trying to do. And there's simple blood tests to check your zinc and your copper level. And it doesn't have to be done often, but if you have been taking high doses of zinc, it probably would be a good idea to have your blood levels checked, both zinc and copper. And these are just a few examples. I just wanted to mention people say, I can't swallow capsules. Things like vitamin D and the herbs like astragalus, which is very supportive, arachnisia golden seal, elderberry, um, all the different nutrients that most of them are available in tablets and capsules, liposomal to get, that gets absorbed through the mucous membrane in drops. Um, so if you do have an issue or there's a certain way you want to take it, it's probably available out there. There's also gummies now. That's the biggest thing. And gummies are good for people who can't swallow pills. Just be careful with the gummies because in addition to the active ingredient, they do usually have an awful lot of sugar and coloring and there's other excipients to make them chewy. And you don't need to be putting that in your body if you can take, take it whatever it is in a different form. And I just put this up, vitamin D is, when you have your vitamin D level checked, they usually show you a range, most labs say 25 to 90 or 100. And if you're 26, they say you're fine, but you're really not. If you're 25 or below, they usually put you on 50,000 units a week for 10 to 15 weeks. And you really, for optimal health, they're now saying, and studies have shown you really want your vitamin D level up around 60. So if you are at 20 or 30, 
you are, besides the bone density issue, it's not good for your, your brain and neurotransmitter. So mental state, not good for your hair and the skin and your bones, but it also isn't good for your immune system. So having your D-level checked once in a while is a very good idea because then you can determine what's the proper amount of D to be taking because too much D isn't healthy for us either. These are two products just to show you some of the combinations. The Immucor has C, D, niacin, zinc, selenium. It's very, it has some reishi mushroom in it, shiitake. So it's a combination of a lot of the things we talked about. So again, you don't have to have six bottles and take out capsules and tablets from each. Enzyme Defense by Enzymetica has been around for a very long time and is very supportive of the immune system. And the extra strength is one capsule a day for maintenance. And if you feel you're coming down with something, you can bump it up to twice a day. And that's an enzyme product. There's all different ways to help your, our immune system. A couple of other ways, virus support, the um, box on the right shows the ingredients of that. It's A, C, B12, um, pantothenic acid. It has zinc, some astragalus, um, andrographis, echinacea, lysine, and acerola. And the label, the approved directions on that, you can take two a day for maintenance. And over the years, we have an awful lot of teachers and nurses that use this prophylactically from fall through the spring, through the cold and flu season. If you feel you're coming down with something, you can take two capsules every hour for six doses, then two capsules three times a day. The pro-SBI, the SBI stands for serum bovine immunoglobulins. That's an immunoglobulin complex. And that is what's Immunoglobulins, when we have breast milk, when a baby's first born, the colostrum has a lot of immunoglobulins, and that's what programs our gut to do its job and helps program the immune system. And our immune system has gotten really knocked around a lot between our diet and stress and the chemicals. And so a lot of people, especially if there's a gut issue also, taking something like SBI, serum bovine immunoglobulin, it's not from the milk, it's coming from the, they extract it from the blood, so you don't have any of the dairy antigens, but that can help reboot the gut or re give a lot of support to the immune system to remind it what it should be doing. And that could be very, very beneficial. Now, there'll probably a lot of people are having questions about COVID. We have to be very careful what we do and say and take for COVID. And so there is a lot of science and a lot of studying behind supporting the immune system and specifically for COVID. This is a chart from um, the East Virginia Medical School. And I put this up just so you can see Pro, they have, the FDA said this is okay for them to say they have the studies and you can go to their website and even see all the references, but they even have a plan for prophylaxis for COVID and it includes vitamin C and quercetin and it's only small amounts. 500 milligrams twice a day on the vitamin C and 250 milligrams of quercetin. Zinc, they, they're saying most people 75 to 100 milligrams a day and you have the quercetin to aid with the absorption, but you wanna make sure your copper is okay. Melatonin, believe it or not, we think of it as for sleep, but it also does support the immune system. Vitamin D, the amount depending upon how what your vitamin D level is, what your blood level is. And they also use famotidine. And that is, they found is very effective and very supportive of the immune system. If somebody does have a case, a mild case of COVID, they're at home, they don't need to be hospitalized. 
they changed some of the amounts and they also have added in a low dose of aspirin because a lot of people that get COVID, there begins to be a clotting issue. So I just put this up here to show you there is science behind using these nutrients. And they found people who are low in zinc, a low in D, their immune system is down. And a lot of the people who are very sick with COVID do have low levels of some of these nutrients. The Harvard School of Public Health agrees that diet and nutritional supplementation can support a healthy immune system. And that shouldn't surprise any of us. Just like our car, you don't, if you have to go for a long drive, you don't fill up your tank with water. It's a lot cheaper than gas, but you don't fill up the tank just so the needle's on full. You want to have the right octane fuel in the tank. Same thing for our body. If we're just eating junk to fill up our belly so the gauge is on full and we feel full, we're watering down our gas and the engine isn't gonna run well. Our immune system can't run well. So eating healthy is very, very important. Now I'm gonna talk about one of the, another real big thing that can affect our immune system and that's stress. Studies suggest that the inability to adapt to stress is associated with the onset of illness, depression, or anxiety. There's been a lot written about the mind-body connection we all know our emotions and our thoughts can affect how our bodies function. Depression can suppress the immune system. Anxiety disrupts digestion and sleep. And anger has an adverse effect on liver function, which is important for detoxing, which can lead to more stress and a decrease in our immune function. This connection, however, works both ways. Not only do our emotions affect our physical health, but our physical health affects our moods, behavior, and emotions. Physical changes in responses to stress allow us to adapt quickly and respond well to dangerous stimulation. If you look at this chart, we're nice and relaxed on the left side. We were designed for, for severe stress, for short bursts, and our body can deal with that. When we get stressed, blood flows to the muscles. It flows away from our digestive tract and our reproductive tracts. We get an increase in blood pressure. Blood sugar levels spike. Our pupils dilate. Digestion slows down almost to a stop. Blood sugar goes way up and is released into the bloodstream. That's to allow us to, to think and fight. Our immune system goes down. If a lion's chasing you, just having your immune system doing its work isn't a good um, expenditure of energy in the body. You want to be able to run a fight more. So our immune system goes down. When the stress is gone, all this goes back to normal and we're back in a state of homeostasis and we just move right along. The problem comes when we have chronic stress all the time. And now there's good stress and bad stress, winning the lottery, getting married, um, exercise or sports, our you know, family members graduating, happy times, those are all stressful, but that's a good stress. And they're for a specific period of time. It doesn't go on and on and on. So in the short term, stress can be an asset. It raises our level of performance during critical events like sporting events or important meetings. But things like the upcoming holiday season can bring either a positive stress or a negative stress. In chronic stress, these processes seem to go on and on and go off course to a different degree in different people. A chronically stressed person might show signs of inflammation, insulin resistance, poor motivation, irregular body rhythms, improper sleep, and we have um, trouble making decisions, initiating activities. We become procrastinators and we have terrible sleep patterns. And that also makes us crave sweets and simple carbs because we have blood sugar dysregulation. Not everyone will show all these signs, but most chronically stressed individuals will display a lot of them. And 
each of us has a threshold of stress that we can deal with. But if you're living under chronic stress, sometimes you can eliminate some of the stresses, but a lot of times you have no control over the things that are stressing you. So what you have to do is figure out ways to help your body deal with the stress since you can't get rid of it. And just getting more and more stress can help us get unraveled. When, when we're chronically stressed, um, our breathing rate increases, the blood flows to the skeletal muscles, blood sugar levels go up. We went over this, but if it's chronic stress, you can start losing your stripes. You can start getting sick. So cortisol is a catabolic hormone. Our adrenals put out cortisol in response to stress, meaning it's a hormone that breaks down tissues. So when it's way out of balance and unregulated, the effect is very damaging to our body. The right amount of cortisol is very healthy for our body. High cortisol level eventually leads to adrenal fatigue or low cortisol. Too much cortisol can suppress the immune system, while too little can lead to autoimmune and rheumatological problems. And looking at this chart, if you have, it sort of doesn't sound right, but if you're too stressed, you could be wired and exhausted at the same time. A lot of people say, I'm so wound up, I'm jumping out of my skin, but I can't get out of my own way. With high cortisol, you can have memory issues, difficulty sleeping, decreased sex drive, weight gain, and a weakened immune system. When the adrenals go too low, you can also be fatigued, bad memory, sleeping problems, sugar and salt cravings, decreased libido and sex drive, depression can set in anxiety, and a decreased immune system. So you can have a lot of the same symptoms whether the cortisol is too high or you're burnt out. But either way, if stress is involved, it has to be addressed. The adrenal glands function behind all of these symptoms because they're the glands that control our reaction to stress and because they interact with other hormones in the body, the thyroid hormones and female and male hormones, the adrenals can affect all these different areas. Some of, this, some of the symptoms of adrenal distress are headaches, environmental sensitivities, fatigue, dizziness upon standing up quick, excess perspiration, salt cravings, alcohol intolerance, um, irritability, and getting sick all the time, the deep, the depressed immune system. When the adrenal fatigue has left a person without energy to cope, they can become very irritable or apathetic. They just don't care. They just aren't doing anything. There are several ways which stress can contribute to weight gain. One of the ways when we're stressed all the time, cortisol is up and cortisol dysregulates blood sugar. So our blood sugar is going up and down, which makes us crave the simple carbs and blood sugar. And so we eat too much of these foods, which raises our blood sugar too high. The body secretes insulin, which then pulls all that sugar out of the blood because it's not healthy to have it high. And it puts it in the belly fat from between the chest and the hips. And so if you're, if you think you're eating well, and you're exercising and you keep putting weight on in that spare tire area, it could be insulin resistance, it could be prediabetes, and it could be that even though you might think your stress level is better, that's sort of relative. If you were extremely stressed and now it's gone down a couple of degrees, you might feel you're not stressed, but compared to being relaxed, you might still be very stressed. Although we usually think of stress as something to be avoided, that's not really possible in a lot of instances. Stress occurs at all level of life. There's nutritional stress and physical, emotional, relationship stress, mental, psychological, and spiritual factors that are all related to stress. Even exercise is a type of physical stress. Medical conditions, relationship changes, and other major changes are very stressful on the system. We're all living in sort of limbo right now with COVID, where we move forward, we go backward. Nobody really knows 
you know, where the light at the end of the tunnel is. That's a stress that most of us are living 24 hours a day. So the problem becomes when stress becomes chronic, causing the adrenal glands to overproduce cortisol. This leads to overtaxed adrenals that become unable to function properly and high cortisol levels prevent sleep. And we need our sleep for detoxing, rebuilding, and re-energizing ourselves. When you don't sleep, there are more hormone imbalances, and then you set the stage for the onset of things falling apart of degenerative diseases. Now, factors that can affect the adrenals, too much caffeine, sugar, gluten, processed foods, eating GMO foods, not eating real food, the additives, refined vegetable oils, hydrogenated fat, white flour, um, blood sugar, poor blood sugar management and poor nutrition. And what's really interesting, this same list of things can have a negative effect on our gut. So we're really hammering ourselves if we're doing a lot of these things. These are things that we have control over and that will help minimize stress on our system. Factors that affect the adrenals are our, life, our lifestyle effects too. Smoking, lack of sleep, overexertion, lack of exercise, excess ex exercise, overprogramming, being way too busy, the poor diet, environmental toxins. These all affect our adrenals, but they also affect the gut. So relax. Maybe learning to say no to some things is a very good thing. Deal with things as they come up. Try not to worry too much about things that you have no control over. That's almost, I know it's hard to do, but it's a waste of energy because you're not going to change anything. Try to eat as clean as possible, as much organic and clean foods, because that's less work for the body to be used cleaning up, which frees up a lot of your antioxidants to be doing what it should be doing. And watch the household cleaners you're using. We're going into the cooler weather, our windows are going to be closing down, and all the cleaners that are chemically laden, that's accumulating in the air and we're ingesting it. And that's very toxic for us. The link between water and stress reduction is well documented. All of our organs, including our brain, need water to function. And if you're dehydrated, your body isn't running well. And that can lead to stress and that can affect your immune system. Studies have shown just half a liter being dehydrated by just half a liter a day can increase your cortisol levels. It's that stressful on the body. Now, you don't want to be downing four glasses of water at once. You want to have a, a good water bottle or a clean glass of water with you at almost all times and just be sipping throughout the day. We also need um, water and nutrients for the immune system. And here are just a, sort of a um, reminder, vitamin C, E, the B vitamins, omega-3, DEA, DHEA, and beneficial bacteria, all important nutrients for dealing with stress, but they're also very important nutrients for the immune system. So it's sort of funny how nature made us that we don't need to have all separate nutrients for each area of the body. A lot of the nutrients are used everywhere. So we've been talking about stress, a couple of very gentle products that we found a lot of people get very good results with. Cortisol manager, if you're stressed, your, your adrenals are supposed to be high in the morning and go down at night. When we're stressed all day, we're still in daytime mode at night. So a lot of people find they, fall, they have trouble falling asleep or they fall asleep for an hour or two and then they wake up and their brain is on and they're racing and they can't get back to sleep, they're in fight or flight. Cortisol manager and the ingredients are right below it is designed to take before bedtime and it just helps cool the adrenals down to baseline so you can drift off into better REM sleep. Doesn't leave you groggy in the morning. 
Lavella on the right side, that's an enterocoded lavender product. And there's been a lot of good clinical studies. Lavender is very good for people with real high stress and the beginning of anxiety. It can be very helpful at helping the body deal with that. It can help just put some calm in the system. And again, that doesn't make you sleepy or drowsy. And just helping reset things and get things calmed down or getting a better night's sleep is very, very helpful for you. There's all sorts of products. And again, these are just some products, you know, I, we could be here all night with all the products that could be beneficial. People are asking about CBD. CBD can, has been shown to be helpful for stress and anxiety. There's a product by plant people called Be Calm and it's CBD. And it also, there's a list of some of the herbs that are in there. They add in some ashwagandha and some holy basil and L-theanine. That's very, very calming to the system. Ashwagandha, very tonic for the adrenals and adrenal response. They're tablets that are, you take them if you feel stressed or stress is cranking up. The dose is two tablets and it doesn't make you groggy when a lot of people find if there's a very stressful situation and they take this, they don't really notice it. But two or three hours later, they look back and say, wow, that really worked. I should be so wound up or I was able to get through that moment. And that can be taken on and off and has been very successful. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can call the store at 781 893-3870, extension three. And the staff is will be very helpful. You can ask them any question. If we don't know the answer, we'll find someone who does and get back to you. If you'd like to email me, you can email me at gary at naturalcompounder.com. You can leave me a voicemail at 781-893-3870. And I'm at extension 111, or if you hit number three when you call in, it'll get over to me. And if you have a lot of questions and a lot of things to go over, you can book a, a um, Zoom or a phone consult time, naturalcompounder.com forward slash Dr. Gary K. And I hope this has been helpful. And now I'm just going to get over here and go through some of the questions and answers. Um, okay, so one of the questions, any advice for vegans in particular regarding immunity? One of the things, the vegan diet is, is a good diet, but it isn't a good diet for some people. So each of us is genetically different. With the vegan diet, one of the things that's very hard to do is to make sure you're getting enough protein. And there's certain things that you can't get. And one of them is B12. So that's important as a cofactor in a lot of the, the processes in the body. So the vegans should be really making sure they're getting enough protein, B12, check their D level. And also there are certain amino acids that are hard to get in the vegetable world. So the vegans should also make sure just like everyone else, the vitamin D, the omega-3s, that all these different levels and the nutrients, the zinc and the copper and, and um, the antioxidants, are at the right levels. And that could be very helpful. Kombu kombu ooh, kombuka, um, is it helpful to the gut? Yes, it is. But you have to have good kombuka. And sometimes if it's sitting around or it wasn't made right, it can have things growing in it, which are harmful. And so you just want to make sure it's fresh and it's a good, a well-made batch. Fulvic and humid, humic solutions as means of getting enough minerals. Fulvic and humic acid 
a lot of time they have a lot of the trace minerals so they can be very good the problem is you can't get a full dose of calcium or magnesium or zinc from that but it does it is very good there's some formulas out there that aid in the absorption of the minerals and so that could be helpful are mushrooms good for depression and anxiety um I'll say sometimes yes for anxiety. If it's true depression, you really should see, seek um, a healthcare professional because yes, some natural products can be helpful, but you wanna do it under a care of a professional. If you spend a lot of time outdoors in the summer, do you still recommend taking D3 and how much would you recommend? Do you take more D3 in the winter? What's very interesting is that's why I said having your D level checked and it's a normal blood test. If your doctor doesn't want to do it, just contact us. We can get you a kit for a finger prick and you can have your levels checked. A lot of us are using sunscreen and wide brimmed hats and long sleeves. And that is blocking us from making vitamin D. And so what a lot of practitioners are saying, and a lot of dermatologists are even saying, earlier in the morning or late in the afternoon, not during the strong time of the sun, getting some unprotected sun exposure for a short period, your body can generate plenty of D. But for those people who are using sunscreen and are covering up, a lot of people are sitting under umbrellas when they're outside. You're not getting the D level. Also different people due to genetics and how dark your skin is can affect how much D you make. So that's why really having your D level checked is very important. In the winter time up north, most people do need to supplement or should supplement with some D and how much will depend upon what your level is. Um, a question, I'm on an immunosuppressive for an autoimmune condition. Should I take higher doses of vitamin and mineral supplements? Are immunosuppressives counteracting the supplements? If you're on an immunosuppressive, there's a serious condition going on. I would talk to your practitioner and have some levels done to know what you need. Because again, if your levels are fine, too much is a strain on the body. And you want to be taking the right amount, not a high amount. So self-medicating, even with nutrients, if you're on immunosuppressants, you should do that under care. And another question, is low magnesium the only cause of restless leg? Good question. No, it can be dehydration. So if you don't have enough water, that can cause it. It can be magnesium. It can be potassium. It can also be things unrelated to that. It can be an imbalance in the central nervous system. It can be a nutrient imbalance. And so some of the pathways aren't working. But generally speaking, you know, making sure you're hydrated, taking some magnesium, having your, your levels checked or potassium level checked is very good. There's also some homeopathic blends on the market that have been very helpful to relieve some of the symptoms of restless leg. All right, somebody wrote, you listed a lot of vitamins and minerals. Are you recommending that everyone take all those pills or do people only take the pills depending upon the deficiencies? If so, how do individuals determine what are their deficiencies? Excellent question. All these questions are excellent. Um, every single nutrient we have at the Wellness Center is an excellent nutrient. And should everyone take all of them? No. Do I take 30 or 40 different products every day? Absolutely not. You should take what's right for you. If your vitamin D level is nice and solid, you don't need to be taking large amounts. Um, so how do you decide or know what you need to do? Part of that could has to do with your diet and your lifestyle. You can, there are lab tests that can be run either through your primary care physician. If they don't have access to it, you can let us know and we can connect you so you can have it done that do profiles on a lot of the different nutrients. 
I think recommendations from some of the medical centers is that you want to take enough D for your, keep your D level where it should be. Finding out most people or a lot of people are taking more zinc. So finding out your zinc and copper level would be very beneficial. And having vitamin C through the summer, it's easy. Just eating some of the nice fresh local fruits and vegetables, we're getting plenty of C. In the winter, it's a little harder, but you don't need huge amounts of it. So I'm trying not, I'm not evading the answer, but what you need to take is different for each person because we're all individuals. So that's where talking to somebody can help give you some guidance into what would be best for you? Because what's best for you might not be the ideal protocol for someone else. Um, someone wrote, I had COVID in July. So do I have antibodies against the disease? And yes, you should. But we aren't doing testing to see each individual could be different and how long they last. We don't know if they go down over time, how quick they go down. So yes, you could still have antibodies against the disease, but it's not a guarantee that you have a high enough level against the disease. They're working on testing that, but we, you know, again, they keep, you know, it's the same answer. We're working on that, but we don't have the data yet. Is taking cortisone supplement, is taking a cortisone supplement, could that help lower your diabetic numbers? And I'll say maybe and maybe not. It all depends upon what's driving those numbers up. Is it the diet? Is it that you're very stressed? If you're very stressed, that can raise blood sugar. So dealing with the stress and helping calm things down and changing lifestyle and diet could be very helpful. So again, it isn't just taking a pill to fix it. You have to figure out what's causing it to go up and work at dealing with the cause of the problem. Um, what are the symptoms of leaky gut? It can be many things. It can be food. The more leakier the gut is, the more food sensitivities people have. It can be stools that swing from your constipated one day and have rabbit pellets. And then all of a sudden you have diarrhea or very mushy stools. It can be gas and bloating and um, odorous gas. It can be skin problems. A lot of people um, start getting hives or reactions to foods on the skin. Eggs, my mentor always said, and it's been proven over and over again, that um, eczema and psoriasis and acne and pimples and dandruff is really a gut issue. You're absorbing things you shouldn't be. And our skin is one of our safety valves to help excrete metabolic waste that can't get out the way it's supposed to. So um, yes, that's a big indicator of leaky gut. Having just a lot of food problems, you know, you're your diet is getting more and more restricted. And there's tests for leaky gut that can be done. Any comments on the immunity connection to acid reflux and what I can take to help with this instead of the proton pump inhibitors? Again, there could be a lot of reasons why you're having acid reflux. And sometimes the proton pump inhibitors are the right thing to prevent the erosion of the esophagus. But a lot of times there's other reasons that are causing the reflux. And so in each person, it could be something different that needs to be addressed. And that's much more specific. I don't have a general answer, but if you do want to email me, or give a call to the wellness center, uh, you know, I'll be glad to get a little more information and give you a little more information. And I think that's the end of the questions. Well, I hope you've all found this um, helpful. I will be working on this tonight and tomorrow, the recording, and I'll get that up on the website so you'll be able to watch it again if you want, or if there's somebody that didn't make it, you can feel free to let them know it'll be there. That's at naturalcompounder.com forward slash blog. 
And thank you so much for attending. I hope you found this helpful. And don't hesitate to get in touch with me with any questions. If you have a question, you didn't want to ask it publicly, um, you Gary at naturalcompounder.com, or you can call me at 781-893-3870, extension 111. And thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.